name is Jill Leonard Pingle and I'm a paleobiologist at Ohio State University. I will be giving a remote lecture titled The Role of Mollusk in Understanding Human Environment Interactions in Historical and Prehistorical Times, providing examples from my work in Central America and in Southern California. This lecture will be broadcast on Facebook Live Friday, May 8th at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time. I'm grateful to Adventures in Archaeology for providing me this opportunity, and I look forward to speaking with you on Friday. I am grateful to Adventures in Archaeology for arranging this opportunity for, for me to speak with you today. This evening, I will be speaking about my work on the role of mollusk in understanding human environment interactions in historical and prehistorical times. Although this topic is not strictly archeological in content, I hope that you will be able to see how mollusks can be used as proxies for past environments. They can be very sensitive to changes in their aquatic environments, both marine and freshwater, and could therefore be useful for making interpretations about the environment in which they lived alongside humans. And I, um, I encourage you that to contact me later if you have a project where you think that using mollusk could provide you with some additional information um, that would be useful in your, in your research. And I'd be happy, very happy to, um, to speak with you about that. Now, I hope that everyone can, um, can see my slides okay. Um, let me know if there are any problems, um, definitely. All right. Um, today, um, I'm going to be talking about or focusing on what mollusks can tell us about how humans have modified their environments, focusing primarily in the past several hundred years. Although my focus has been on historical time, these approaches would also work in prehistorical time. And I think that there are many opportunities for better understanding how humans were modifying their environments um, in prehistorical times. My training in graduate school was actually as a more traditional paleontologist, working with rocks and with fossils that were millions of years old, long before humans were modifying their environment. Um, but I have always been interested in how the physical environment influences biotic communities. Um, and this has um, provided a segue or for a, way, a way for me to, to pivot my research interest towards the recent with a desire to better understand how humans impact their environments and consequently how this impacts biotic communities. And I think I have, I have done this, I have tried to change my research because we live in a time of, of rapid environmental change. Um, we are absolutely um, on a, a threshold um, where we need to be thinking about our impacts on the environment. And these impacts and changes include biodiversity loss, climate change, landscape change, um, especially with increasing urbanization of the landscape and pollution of our air and water. We can see these changes happening around us all the time, both at a global scale, as we see rampant forest fires and global, global temperatures skyrocket, um, as well as at regional or local levels. Probably many of us have seen in our lives, uh, in our lifetimes, cities or villages expand as new buildings are built. However, um, sometimes it can be difficult to assess how much change has occurred, especially when we are comparing what we see today with what a habitat or ecosystem should look like naturally. And this can lead us um, to the question of, of how we assess environmental change. How do we know how much has occurred? Um, and how do we know how we get back to a natural state or if we can get back to a natural state? Um, this is a, especially a human problem because our lifetimes are so short. Many of us as individuals, we don't know what a natural ecosystem looks like because we have never seen one. This is sometimes referred to as shifting baseline syndrome. This term was first used by a marine biologist, Daniel Pauly, um, and so it has a lot of use in the marine biology community and the marine conservation community. 
but it is widely applicable to many other contexts. Basically, shifting baseline syndrome describes a gradual change in the accepted norms for the condition of the environment due to a lack of information or experience. And it is one of the biggest barriers to addressing environmental problems today. So I'm just gonna illustrate for a minute. Um, I'm gonna use this illustration of fishermen because that is where the concept came from. Um, so for example, we have an older fisherman who um, started fishing, fishing maybe in the 1940s. Um, and for him, he has, he has an idea of what a marine community should look like based on his experience in the, 19, in, in the 1940s when he started fishing. Over time, he has undoubtedly seen the decrease in size of many commercial fish, um, as well as the removal of some larger bodied animals like sea turtles or sharks. Um, his son, who is also a fisherman, probably started fishing a couple of decades after him. And his earliest memories of the marine community or the fish stock um, will have shifted a little from his father's experience. Maybe he never saw large sharks or other types of fish. Uh, maybe he was used to lower stock or smaller stock. But he doesn't really notice the absence of things that he never saw before. And then we can move on to his son. Another generation goes by. He started fishing a couple of decades after his father. Um, and his perception of what is normal is going to be different from his father's and very different from his grandfather's. This type of slow, gradual change can really distort what we perceive as a normal, healthy ecosystem. So I'm gonna provide you now with another example from the historical ecological literature. And here you will see two pictures taken from the same dock in the Florida Keys in, in Florida in the United States. These are recreational fishing operations operating, um, it's the same recreational fishing operation actually, um, uh, probably a different uh, captain of the boat, um, probably a different boat, but it's actually the same dock um, and the same operation. In the upper left hand corner, you will see a family posing happily with their catch from the day. Um, and in the lower right hand corner, you'll also see the catch of that day from 2007. In the picture from 1958, you will notice that there are several of the fish that are as large as the man in the photo, if not perhaps larger. Um, these are a fish called Goliath grouper um, that live in the Atlantic. And because of over harvesting, um, and you'll see here, this is one catch that has maybe eight to 10 Goliath grouper in it. Um, but because of this over harvesting, Goliath grouper was recognized as an endangered species and harvesting of the fish was closed in the 1990s. Um, by the mid 1900, or sorry, by the mid 2000s, um, Goliath grouper appeared to be recovering um, and there was lobbying to open the fishery once again. But around the same time, this paper came out showing and demonstrating that there was still a, a overfishing of the Goliath grouper. Thinking about what the biomass looked like in the 1950s from these historical photographs compared to the biomass of what is coming out of the reefs and the Florida Keys today. Um, so fortunately, because of this study and other studies that have um, have shown that recovery that we perceive in the past 20 years is not recovery to a natural state. Um, the, the fishery has remained closed, um, showing that this type of data can have an impact at, re at rectifying some of the bias that can be introduced due to shifting baseline syndrome. But by all means, this is not the only ecosystem in which we see shifting baselines. And when we think about ecological recovery, especially when systems have only been monitored for 10 to 20 years, we, we can't know what a natural system looked like unless we look back in time further. And as archeologists, I am sure that you appreciate this deep time perspective. All right. So today I'm going to share a couple of case studies that I have worked on related to this problem of providing baselines and ecosystems that have been heavily impacted um, by human in by human activities. 
Um, as I stated before, my work has primarily focused on the historical past, um, but I hope that you will see that these techniques can be easily applied to the prehistorical past as well. So tonight I'm going to be talking about um, work that I have done in Central America, specifically in Panama, um, working on coral reefs. And I'll also be sharing a case from the Southern California coastline um, where I have been working on uh, eutrophication and nutrient pollution along the Los Angeles coast. So I'm gonna start um, first by talking about the work in the Caribbean. Coral reef ecosystems in the Caribbean are in an awful state. It's really, really bad. Um, it's estimated that in only the past 30 years, that total coral cover has decreased by at least 50%. And recent studies show that this estimate is probably actually fairly conservative. Um, when you look at specific types of corals, um, the large reef building corals like Acropora, um, Palmata seen here and Acropora cervicornis in the picture to the farthest right, um, they have declined as much as 95% in the past 30 years. Um, this loss of coral has resulted in a complete ecosystem shift from reefs dominated by coral to reefs dominated instead by macroalgae. And you can see an example of one of these reefs um, from the Florida Keys where there is very low water clarity most of the corals are dead and the, the reef is now covered by algae, fast growing algae. Right. Another example of how um, dramatic this decline is, um, is another location in the Florida Keys. Um, this, was, this location, this reef was photographed in 1976 on the top here and in 2016 on the bottom. And what you will clearly notice, um, is that there is complete loss of the reef over that sh relatively short amount of time. What was in the late 1970s, a healthy dense stand of Acropora cervicornis has completely disappeared by 2016. And this, um, this seems really dramatic and you might think that this is just a one case, um, you know, one oddball case, but this type of decline is actually very common throughout the Caribbean, um, which is, distressing and, and disappointing and, and actually very hard to understand for coral reef biologists. Um, th the cause of this decline is so complicated and it's really highly debated um, because there are so many factors that contribute to coral reef decline. Um, climate change and ocean acidification, um, loss of important ecosystem components um, caused by overfishing, caused by overfishing can cause coral reef decline, um, coral bleaching caused by warmer oceans, pollution um, by ru and runoff. All of these things can have a negative, all of these things do have a negative impact on coral reef health. And, and so it is a major question for coral reef biologists and conservation and conservationists, um, which factors should we be focusing on um, which are most important. Um, what are the key components of, of coral reef health? Um, and answering these questions um, was the root of the research project that I'm going to present to you today. Um, we really wanted to know when did coral reefs begin to decline? Are these historical or are these modern historical or prehistorical shifts? And um, can we, by looking at the timing of reef decline, can we put a finger on what, which of these components of coral reef health are, are most important? Can we point to one that is more important than others? All right, so I'm gonna be um, telling you about a project that I um, worked on with my collaborator, Katie Kramer. Um, Katie is, is pictured here collecting a, a coral core. Um, and it really, the work happened in, in two phases. So first, phase one of this project involved collecting large but short sediment cores um, that were collected immediately adjacent to living coral reefs in the Bocas del Toro region of Panama. Um, 
So Boca del Toro is located in the northwestern part of the country of Panama in Central America. Um, and here is a, a larger, um, a zoomed in uh, area um, map of Bocas del Toro of the area. Um, we chose Bocas del Toro because of its interesting geography. So as you can see from the map, there are two large lagoons in the area which contain reefs. One that is more heavily impacted by um, freshwater runoff and the other that is not, um, has less runoff in it. Um, and they also have a, a pretty good archeological record of human habitation in the area, which um, comes into play when we talk about longer course. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so as I said before, during this first phase, we collected wide but short cores. Um, and just to give you a sense for what we mean when we talk about coring, um, because you, you might not be familiar with it as, as archeologists, um, more um, traditional coring will take long aluminum pipes that are maybe four centimeters wide and, and shove them into the sediment. And I'll be showing some of them later. Um, in this case, we wanted to collect as much large coral heads as possible. And so we actually used um, an oil drum, which is not a traditional use for, for a core, but what we used here. So we, we pounded the oil drum, which you can kind of see here into, into the sediment and then collected um, sediment, but also shells and coral heads, everything between one and 20 centimeter increments. Um, and so those different increments represent different time on the reef. Um, so then using this data, we were able to look at changes um, in both the mollusk, primarily the bivalves, which I was working on, um, but also the coral head um, through time. And so this is my collaborator, Katie Kramer, pictured here um, holding a couple of coral heads. Katie is a coral biologist, so she interpreted the environmental changes from the corals um, while I concentrated on the bivalves. And what we found is that both groups um, show significant changes through time. So significant temporal trends in both the bivalves, in the corals, um, show trajectory of change beginning um, before 1960, but continuing past 1960. Uh, and so in, in this case, we are using 1960 as, um, as our guideline for sort of modern and then pre-modern. Um, this is, this was easy to do um, because of carbon-14 dating. Um, in the carbon-14 signature, there is um, a, a large signature of change due to nuclear testing at the time. And so it was easy for us to say pre and post 1960, um, where uh, dating more refined than that was complicated with the carbon-14. In future cores, we use different dating techniques, which, which I will tell you about later. But for phase one, we just used pre and post 1960. Um, which was enough for this sort of um, first phase of research. And so first I'll talk about the coral. Um, so Katie observed a shift in the dominant coral type through time, throughout this core. Um, the bottom of the core or earlier time, pre-1960, um, was dominated by this coral, Acropora cervicornis, which you've probably heard me mention before, this is one of the corals that is experiencing significant decline in the Caribbean at this time. Um, however, before 1960, it was the dominant coral in the reef. Um, post 1960 and um, increasing towards the recent, um, Agaricia tenuifolia becomes the, the most common coral head. And now you might say, who cares? What does it matter? A coral's a coral. Um, well, not exactly. Not all corals are created equal. Um, Acropora cervicornis is a relatively slow growing coral. It has very specific environmental needs. Um, and really, really, it has to grow in very clear water. Agaricia tenuifolia is referred to more as a weedy coral. It is relatively quick growing um, and also does not have very high a uh, high bar for environmental quality um so it can grow in muddier waters it does not require high water clarity or low nutrients um it'll grow just about anywhere 
Um, so it's they're not really um, representative of the same type of coral reef, although they are both corals. Right. So then as a companion study to work on the coral reefs, I looked at, um, at the mollusk. And um, the bivalves were actually able to contribute some really interesting information, um, specifically looking at this one particular bivalve called Dendostria frons, um, which is also known as the frond oyster. And this guy is really cool and very interesting because um, they're actually able, Dendostria frons actually grow hooks on the outer part of their shell, which you can kind of see in this picture here. And also you can see why it grows those hooks in this picture. So the Dendostria fronds, when it settles as a juvenile or in its larval stage, um, it will settle onto a hard substrate. So a branch or a finger of a coral, um, and then it will grow the hooks around that so that, and it stay there for its entire lifetime. So these, can, these are commonly found on, on um, finger-like coral, um, like Acropora cervicornis. They also can grow on mangrove roots, or on gorgonian or, or soft corals, so sometimes called sea fans or sea whips. Um, so here's an example of, of those corals growing on mangrove roots, on mangrove roots, and also on a soft coral here. All right, so you might be like, okay, well, what's the story here with this Dendostria fronds? Well, we observed a notable decrease in the abundance of Dendostria fronds pre-1960 and post-1960. So they're almost no, they're never found um, in more recent sediments. They're just not there. They're not observed in the living community. Um, also, gorgonian corals are not, or soft corals are not commonly seen in the reefs of Bogus del Toro today. So they are, they're almost never found. Um, and we wouldn't have known that they used to be present if not for the high abundance of dendostria in the core samples. So this can provide us an example of how one organism, this bivalve that is preserved um, in sediment samples or in geologic records, um, can be determined, can be used to determine a local extinction of another organism that does not have a record. So soft corals do not have any skeletal parts that we would expect to be preserved in these cores. And um, we would not have known that they used to be present in these reefs if we were just basing that on observations from the living right now. So it was really handy to have Dendostria fronds to tell us about this local um, extinction of, of a group. Um, and so that helps us know that the Gorgonian, that Gorgonian corals used to be common. All right, so that was really just phase one to get a rough sense of what was happening with the, with the coral reefs. Um, phase two involved um, longer cores. Um, so after seeing all of those many changes that began even before 1960, we wanted to have a better constraint on the timing of change. In addition, we want in addition, we wanted to see if coral reefs were influenced by human activities um, and if longer cores could help us determine that. Um, so we collected uh, longer reefs from three locations within Almirante Bay in the Bogus del Toro area. Um, and I am going to be telling you mostly about the core um, located here from Punto de Nado, um, because that core has the longest record. It has one of the most straightforward stories of, of coral reef health. Um, um, and I will I'll tell you more about the dates in just a second. But I wanted to provide you as well with some of the human population context for this area. Um, because as archaeologists, I'm assuming that you're in interested in that. Um, so human occupation in Panama is known from at least 11,000 years before the Common Era, uh, mostly from spear points along the Pacific coast. Um, land clearing by fire, um, there's evidence for that by about 9,000 BCE. Um, and there's also evidence of agriculture by approximately 2500 um, BCE, so before the Common Era. Um, and this agriculture was primarily mace-based, um, so they were growing a lot of corn in the area. Um, the population densities on the Pacific side of Panama were much higher than the Caribbean side, which we are talking about today. So we're focusing on the Caribbean side, which is much less densely populated than the Pacific side of Panama. Um, 
Um, when the Spanish conquistadors came in the 16th century, there were very high density cities um, and advanced agricultural communities um, on the Pacific side. And other work has shown that they had a high impact on com marine communities. However, on the Caribbean side of Panama, where we're working, there was much less indigenous development. So in the area of Bocas del Toro, the human settlement has been known um, only from 600 AD, so much later than the Pacific side. Um, and these settlements appear to have been much smaller than their Pacific side counterparts. Um, while they were relying on marine resources and there is evidence for fishing and um, collecting of marine resources, um, the agricultural impact was much smaller. So instead of having a large slash and burn agricultural um, practice, they practiced something called forest farming, um, where they would cultivate fruiting trees and nut bearing trees, seed bearing trees, um, and also relied a lot on um, cultivation of root vegetables. And so that type of farming maintained plant cover, uh, minimizing erosion and runoff. And that will be important later on, but I just wanted to give you the human context as well. All right, so um, like I said before, we're I'm going to focus just on one of these cores today because it is, has a nice continuous record from about 1100 to 1980, which we will call pretty modern. So that brings us almost up to the present. Um, so we have about 900 years um, ending with reef decline and, and death. Um, so we um, were able to get these dates using uranium, using the uranium thorium system, um, which gives us much more reliable dates than carbon-14 um, for the, this for marine dates. All right. So in order to understand how coral ecosystems changed through time throughout the core, and, and over approximately the last mil millennia, we tried to took we tried to take a holistic community approach. So we looked at all of the major animals preserved in the cores, um, from tiny foraminifera to the large coral heads, and then um, used those groups to um, as as proxies for reconstructing the environment. So here you'll see there are the four major components that we looked at, urchins, bivalves, um, foraminifera, and corals. Um, we looked at certain groups within these large, um, large uh, taxonomic groups that would tell us something about the environment. So for example, um, forams are divided into two groups that will tell us something about their environment, symbiont bearing or non-symbiont bearing. We looked at different types of corals that can fall in different functional groups, um, as well as bivalves and urchins that tell us about, that live in different types of environments that have different environmental constraints to tell us about their environment. All right, and then here you can see really quickly um, the ecosystem conditions that are linked to, to different groups. I don't expect you to memorize that all, um, but I just want you to understand the approach that we take. All right, so in order to see how communities change through time, we performed a principal component analysis um, on all of the, the um, segments of community through time. So this is just a way of visualizing multi-dimensional data, or in this case, data on several variables, all the different types of animals that we're finding in the core and their abundances through time. In, in two dimensional space. Um, so when you're looking at this, just remember that the proximity of the samples represented by dots is indicative of the similarity between the samples. So the closer the dots are, the more similar their communities are. All right, so when we did this, just to, to give you a little bit of orientation, the whole community ordination showed a strong coupling among bivalve, fish, and urchin functional groups. So in faunal, chemosymbiotic bivalves were correlated with micropredator fish in echinometra urchins, and epifaunal bivalves positively correlated with herbivorous fishes and like the tychus and trypanoises urchins. So what you need to take away from that is that certain bivalves, certain corals, and certain urchins live together in the same community, and others live together in a different type of community. They're telling us about two big um, different types of communities. Um, 
However, the choral community composition composition was not necessarily related to the other community components. All right, so um, so basically what I'm telling you, I wanted to give you a little bit of background, but what I'm telling you is that the ordinations show a shift between two different reef states, a dominance by infaunal and chemosymbiotic bivalves, parietes corals, micropredatory fishes, and echinometra urchins, and another reef state dominated by epifaunal bivalves, madraceous mirabilis corals, and herbivorous fishes. So there's two communities that we're looking at. And what we see is that these communities exist in different times um, in the same place. So we're going to look at community shift through time. All right, so the community here, um, this is the, the beginning of the reef community starting from about 1100 up to 1300 AD. So blue will represent that time. Um, so this was the original community state dominated by parietes corals and epiphanal suspension feeding bivalves. And this represents um, establishment of the reef community. It's the initial reef phase. And then as we flip through time, we'll see that the community begins to change from 1300 to 1500, and then from 1500 to 1700. And this represents the height of reef accretion. So this is when the reef was a climax community, if you think about it as far as ecological succession. This is when the reef is reaching its full reef potential, right? It's looking like a full blown reef community, lots of big coral heads, lots of fish, lots of things going on. But then starting around 1750, um, the reef begins to shift from 1700 to 1800, and then it shifts further to the right on this ordination plot um, towards a community dominated by infaunal deposit feeding bivalves, micropredatory fish, and different types of urchins. And that continues up through the, the present era until the reef, until a reef accretion or growth um, ends entirely and the reef is essentially dead. All right, so the next thing we did to, to better understand these trends um, was to try to see if water quality was associated with these two different um, communities that we see, right? The declining reef, community or the, the Climax Reef community. And what we saw was that when you look at the symbiont bearing foraminifera, um, which we use as a proxy for clear water because these foraminifera house um, algae that require sunlight. Um, so they are used as a proxy for water quality. We see that in these times of high water quality or high water clarity, we have um, these these types of communities um, and in at times of low water quality with um, not very clear water, we have these types of reef communities. So, so what we can say from this is that by looking at water clarity, we see that beginning in, 1700, in 1750 AD approximately, there was a decline in the reef water clarity that led to a shift in the reef community composition. All right, and then if you look at what the, the reef looks like today, there's a picture of, of a reef with poor water quality and high algae. This is similar to what you would find in Punto Donato, in Punto Donato today. It's very low quality, it's hard to dive on. Um, and and there are lo there's lots of runoff which can produce algal blooms. So this transition um, beginning to move towards the reef that we see today began way back in the 1700s, around 1750. Um, so this brings us back to our motivating questions. Um, are changes in coral reef ecosystems recent or historical? Um, and can we disentangle the root cause of stress to the coral reef ecosystems? Well, it definitely looks from our research, looks like from our research that um, coral reef decline began long before the 1960s. And it also seems to be really linked um, to a change in water clarity issues. All right, so all of our research indicates that this, um, that degradation began long before the 20th century and is closely tied to land use, but what does that mean? What was happening in 1750 um, that allowed uh, coral, that caused coral reefs to begin to decline? Um, 
And the answer is quickly, briefly, um, banana plantations. So um, by the late 1700s, uh, banana plantations were beginning to be established along the Caribbean coast, um, particular, particularly in the area of Bocas del Toro, um, with many of that, much of that runoff coming off into Almirante Bay. Um, so there's clearing of natural forest um, and, and then also an increase in population as um, workers from the West Indies are coming into the banana plantations. And this, the banana plantation boom um, has continued throughout the 20th century. If you go there today, you will still see large banana plantations, um, which are of course being treated by all, all kinds of herbicides and pesticides, which is getting into the water. Um, affecting the reefs at Bocas del Toro. Okay, so what does that mean for coral reef conservation and management? Um, is it good or bad or neither? Um, I guess I would say that I actually view this as kind of good news. Um, I know it looks pretty dreary for the reefs in, in Panama, but I think that the research that shows that, um, that there's a lot of impact from runoff is actually positive. Um, because runoff and pollution can be controlled locally, right? So bigger issues like climate change, the temperature of ocean water, that is a global issue that requires all nations working together in order to address that. However, if we think that reefs can be um, salvaged or saved or conserved with local action, that's a little bit more realistic for us to, to approach and think about. And so this research suggests that possibly if we're able to um, help make reefs healthier by controlling um, pollution and land uh, pollution and runoff from, from land use, then maybe we can actually have an impact on coral reef health. Okay. So real briefly, um, I know I'm running short on time. Um, I'm going to talk about one other um, research project that I have done on off the coast of Southern California. Um, and, and this is done in order um, to, um, to better understand nutrient pollution and how that can impact coastal communities. Um, so Southern California, especially the areas of Los Angeles and Orange County, are notorious for sewage pollution in coastal waters. Um, so beaches in some areas are still closed during heavy rainfall events. You can't go swimming because there is sewage in the water, which makes it unpleasant to swim in. Um, so this history of pollution began in the early 1900s um, because the city of Los Angeles was growing so rapidly um, that it was, unable, and it was unable to keep up with the infrastructure needed. Um, and then also for a long time, there's just this perception that you know, the ocean is big, we can dump anything into it, we can just put in our raw sewage, it's all going to be fine, it's not going to matter. Um, but then it quickly became apparent that it did kind of matter if you were dumping raw sewage into the ocean, like that was not healthy, it was not good for people, and it was not good for the animals living in the ocean. Um, so there are six major waste wastewater um, treatment plants along the Southern California coastline. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on this one in particular, which is the White's Point um, outfall. It's located on the Palos Verdes Peninsula in Los Angeles. Um, and so the motivating questions for this research is really, um, can we use sediment cores to detect historical um, or documented changes in the environment? Um, and can these subfossil assemblages help us understand what natural communities should look like? And so um, I was able to do this um, with the support from the research vessel Melville and a large um, scientific crew. So just we'll give a quick shout out to them um, before continuing on. All right, so one of the reasons I chose to work at the White Point outfall is that because we have a good record of the history of um, treatment at this outfall and also um, because of the Clean Water Act, Los Angeles County Sanitation District has been required to collect benthic survey data of the living communities since the 1970s. So I have a good living record to work with as well. So just to give you a quick, um, a, I don't know, like snapshot of what was happening at the White Point outfall through time, it was um, first established in, in the 1940s. Um, from 1940 until 1970, um, it was uh, practicing very limited primary treatment. Um, 
And at times of heavy outfall, there was no primary treatment. And so what you see is what you'd expect from 1940 to 1970, that there is an increasing amount of um, suspended solids to the ocean, um, an increase, increasing, increasing um, flow and in millions of gallons of water um, per day going into the ocean. I don't think we need to talk too much about what suspended solids um, in sewage means. It's just, you know, solid waste. Um, and then in 1970, the United States enacted the Clean Water Act, which required sewage treatments, all sewage to be treated. Um, and so from 1970 till about the mid 1980s, there is a decrease in suspended solids as um, advanced primary treatment um, was put in place. So screening out of suspended solids. Um, and then from 1980 until the 2000s, they started to um, practice um, more uh, secondary treatment of sewage, which is based mostly on microbes, trying to reduce the amount of nutrients getting into the water. Um, and then since 2002, approximately, there's been um, full secondary treatment and the water coming out of White, Fall, of White Point outfall is, is pretty clean. So they've done a lot of work since the 1970s. All right. So this just gives you um, a little bit of context for where we're looking at. Here's the Palos Verdes Peninsula off of L.A. County. Here's L.A. Port right here. Um, and here's the White Point outfall. Now, I said that since the Clean Water Act um, happened, that L.A. County had to do, was required by law to do um, yearly annual um, reports on the living community. Um, and these are numbered their transects where they would go and do their live collecting. So I'm looking at transect number 10, right? Um, because this is close to the outfall, but just a little bit upstream um, of, of the current. Um, so we're not looking at the place places um, that are downstream that were really highly impacted. Um, we wanted to see some impact, but not um, total death and destruction and decay. Um, also, these areas are um, still have a lot of high, a lot of high concentration of um, the chemical DDT. Um, so it wasn't necessarily um, super safe for me to be digging around in the mud from from these transects. So we're going to be looking at transect number um, ten. All right. So first, I'm going to provide present the live data. So this is data from the biomonitoring by the LA County Sanitation District. Um, and it begins in 1972, and it, we have data up until 2014 from them. What I'll say sh show on the top, um, this is just raw number of individuals. It's on a log scale because during the 70s and 80s, these, um, these communities are dominated. And when I mean dominated, I mean there are thousands and thousands of them compared to one or two of other things. Um, by chemosymbiotic feeders, and particularly um, this guy pictured to the right, Parvulacina tenia sculpta. So this is a bivalve that houses um, bacteria within it as a chemosymbiont. Um, that big bacteria um, is a sulfide is sulfide reducing, and so these guys are really highly pollution tolerant. They can live in very disgusting locations where there's really low oxygen where there's really low oxygen and really high amount of nutrients. And so during this um, heyday of uh, sewage from 1970 to about the 1980s, they were quite happy while everything else was quite unhappy. Another way to look at this is just sort of the proportional abundance of functional groups um, where chemosymbionts are in red and everything else are in different colors. So every bivalve that's doing something besides housing a chemosymbiont in their body um, whether they're filter feeding, deposit feeding, or, or doing a mix, um, living in funnel. Um, these guys uh, are dominating the assemblage. It's almost 100% of the assemblage from 1972 until the mid-1980s. Um, and then you can see that there is begins to be a shift in the community after you know we've had some more treatment, um, especially after we introduce secondary treatment to reduce the amount of nutrients, you begin to get a different community. All right, so that's what we see in the living data. Um, but we also wanted to see what we saw in the de dead data, in the, in the geologic core data, um, and compare that to the living data to see if it showed us a similar trend and verify the use of cores for reconstructing communities and looking for impacts of pollution. 
Um, so we were we did this by collecting box cores um, from 50 meter water depth. So um, if you're not familiar with what a box core is, it this is a box core being lowered off the back of the research vessel here. This is what the box core looks like when we bring it up. Essentially, a box core is a big metal box with a shovel on the bottom. Drop it down into the mud at the bottom of the ocean, scoop it back up. And then we subsampled it using these plexiglass square cores, which you can also see here. So after we recovered the square core, the square cores, they were extruded at two centimeter increments. So you can see um, this is pushing the core out from the bottom. Here is a two centimeter, centimeter increment that these um, research assistants are sampling here and putting it into a bag. So we had two centimeter increments representing approximately 10 decades or 10 years each, a decade each. So using um, lead to 10 chronology, we were able to date these sediment cores. The top of the core um, dated to about 2006, the bottom of the core to about 1896. We have about 100 years of, of um, about 100 year record in these cores. All right, and so this is what um, this is what the bivalves look like from the core. So these are this is the core data taken from bivalves collected in those two centimeter increments and then dated with the lead to ten chronology. Um, so what you'll see here is we have the core going back to about 1900 and up to about 2006. Um, and this is same the same that I showed you for the live data. On the top is number of individuals, and on the bottom is proportion of functional groups. So um, in, in red is that same parvuli sign of the chemosymbiotic feeder. And so what you see, especially it's easier to see in the proportion of abundance, but you can also see it in the number of individuals, is that in the 60s, um, actually beginning in the 50s, going through the 60s and 70s, there is this peak in the abundance of chemosymbiotic feeders and a peak in the number of those um, where they become more the most abundant functional group in the assemblage. Um, but what you'll also notice is that while we have a pretty good temporal fidelity, the signal is damped from what it should be. Um, it's reaching about 40% um, instead of 100% like it was in the live data. All right, so um, so this is this is good news, bad news, right? Like it's telling us the same trend, but not exam ex but not to the same um, degree. And so how do we explain that? Um, and we can explain it by something called time averaging, um, which paleontologists use a lot, and I'm sure archaeologists are also um, familiar with as well. Um, I'm going to give you a short analogy, so just bear with me for a second. So what is time averaging? Um, so on, the, on, on these pictures here, you see at the top, these are my, my boys, my two kids, um, and you'll see they're all like dressed up in like sweater vest and button-up shirts. They do not normally look like this. This is a snapshot in time, like two seconds where they're actually clean and wearing nice clothes. Um, but that's not the overall state of affairs. Like if you piled up all of their dirty laundry for a week and looked at looked through their clothes, you would see that there's not very many button up shirts, right? Like there's lots of um, t-shirts and jeans and maybe a sweater and pajamas, right? This is more on average what they're wearing. Um, so we can we can look at we can think about what that means for biological assemblages kind of in the same way. So the living data shows us a snapshot. Like it's one afternoon on one day, one year in time. Like it is a quick snapshot of what the community looks like. Um, but the death assemblages or the all of the dead shells that were pulling out of those cores, um, that shows us everything that lived and died for several decades. It's an accumulation of shells. Um, and so that's kind of like that pile of laundry that shows us more of an average through time. Like this is what we're what we're seeing at that at that point in time um, or, or over the geologic record. Um, so they so they look a little bit different. And why we get this this damping signal is because there there's mixing and time averaging. So another way to think of that is also is by looking at um, a, a non-parametric multi-dimensional dimensional scaling. So this is another way um, that we can visualize uh, as we did ordinations with the coral reef data. It's another way to visualize multi-dimensional or multivariate data in two dimensions. And so what I'm showing you here um, are the, the live collected data, the living data in 
colored circles and the core data in these black um, squares. And so what you'll see is that these living data show changing assemblages through time right, with the red over here being the 70s and the orange 80s, yellow 90s, um, green early 2000s, blue um, 2010s and on. Um, so there's change through time in the living data. But also what we see is that the, the core data is also really separated from the living assemblages. So the core data is different and it's different because of this time averaging. But what is interesting is when we look just at the core data on this graph to the right, we can see that the core data also shows a temporal trend. And it kind of goes in a circle here, right? So in the 1900s, 20s, and 30s, um, it's over here in this far upper right-hand corner. And then as the community becomes impacted, it moves down here to this lower um, right-hand corner, which is sort of that high impact, highly impacted community. And then after treatment, it begins to migrate back, um, back towards, and actually in 2010, we're really moving towards this um, more natural community of the 1900s. So there's a trajectory of change there as well, um, which is kind of good news because it's moving back to the early 20th century. Um, but there's another story um, to tell here as well when we look at this separation. Why is the core data different from the living data? Why is that time averaging having such a big impact on the community composition? And when we look at the, at the bivalves that are preserved here, we can see that these core assemblages are preserving a relic fauna that is not currently seen on the Palos Verde shell. So there are um, bivalves such as the Nucleolana seen here in the right, on the upper right, and um, uh, uh, pectins seen on the lower right that are not seen alive, not collected alive, on the Palos Verde shelf today. They just aren't there. And when we um, perform dating of these, um, we can see that they are actually, these nucleana can actually be several millennia old. Millennia old right? So they're really, really old shells. Like some of them are, you know, hundreds of years old. Some of them are thousands of years old and even 5,000 years old. So these really, really old shells are being mixed up with the younger shells and they are damping the signal, but also telling us something new. They're telling us about shells that lived on the coast thousands of years ago. All right, so if we go back to these motivating questions, um, can the sediment cores detect historical or documented changes in the environment? Yes, we saw that that we when we look at the living, the live collected data and the core collected data, we can see similar, similar trends, right? Which helps us ground truth this approach for looking at community change in areas where we don't have this type of living uh, data or monitoring data. Um, and then also this question, can subfossil assemblages help us understand what natural communities should look like? And, and yes, they can, right? We know um, what the community looked like in the past. Um, and we have these really deep time bivalves telling us what the community looked like even thousands of years ago. So if we, we um, think about lessons for conservation and management, um, one of the good, the good news here is that the benthic community appears to be recovering to a more natural state with increasing wastewater treatment. So since the late 1980s, as wastewater treatment has been um, becoming better in the area, we've seen a decrease of these back to sort of like pre-1930s levels. We're seeing an increase in other functional groups. And if you recall back to the core, to the core data, to the core data in the multi-dimensional scaling, we saw that it was sort of making a circle and the tra trajectory was going back towards what it was like in the 1900s. But there's also a little bit of bad news from, for conservation and management as well. So dating of these Nucleana tafira show that many individuals are very, very old, um, but we're not seeing them in the, in the living community at all. So there are some bivalves that are functionally extinct along the LA coastline area today. Um, and they're not likely to ever come back because the, the um, sediment has changed dramatically. It used to be a sandier sediment. It's now really muddy. Um, recent research has shown that that began in the 1800s with cattle ranching and has continued because of increasing land clearing and urbanization today. So while benthic communities are recovering because of treatment of pollution, um, there are other 
sort of other fundamental modifications to the environment that has um, made it impossible for us to go back to a, a completely natural environment. And I think that as we dig into other environmental changes throughout the globe, we'll see that there are um, remediation efforts that can be under undergone. There are conservation efforts and restoration efforts, but fundamentally many um, environments and ecosystems have changed in a way that we can't really ever quite get back to a true, truly natural um, state or condition. All right, so um, that is, that's all. Um, that's the end of my talk. Um, I'd like to once again thank uh, Adventures in Archaeology for the opportunity I had to speak with you today. Um, and um, of course, thank all of my co-authors and funding sources for this research. Um, I would be happy to take questions now if I can figure out how to do this. Um, <laughs>